This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. The website is offplanetradio.com. You can also find us, and this is important, at patreon.com forward slash offplanetmedia. I'm sorry, Off Planet Media, right? Did yeah, I get? The, yeah. I did not screw that up. Good. Well, at least I, at least we got that out of the way. So it's important because, um, given the current trends and climate, uh, I think these public, free public, so-called free public platforms. Uh, trust me, somebody's paying. I think we pay too high a price for that. I think we need to take ownership of our intellectual property, and you need to take ownership of your mind and stop being a slave to large corporate interests. So in the months ahead, it's going to be bye-bye YouTube. I'm just saying. Anyway, we've got a great show lined up. We have a, uh, a terrific guest, the beginning of a new series, and Emily is here to tell you all about it. Hi, everybody. Good to be back. So you guys, most of you anyway, have, or have been listening, have been enjoying and following this um, series we've been doing with Cliff High on time. And um, there'll be more of that coming. And that has been so, we've, we've enjoyed it a lot. And it's, you guys seem to have as well. And it's been so successful that we've decided to take on another series with an equally deserving guest of that much time because she's so interesting. So this will be uh, the start of our new series on the human game. And to dissect this topic with us, we have Sonia Barrett, author of The Holographic Canvas and the creator of uh, Business of Disease. And she will be with us for a mini part series on this topic. We have no idea where it's gonna go. We just know where we're starting. So Sonia Barrett, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Well, thank you so much. I'm, um, I'm thrilled to be here. And I, I like the approach that you guys take because that's the approach that I take. I just, you know, we just flow, we, you know. I, I think sometimes that's so necessary because sometimes people are so used to um, a, a structured, um, a, you know, way of operating and it doesn't allow for the free flow of information to just kind of show up and all of that. So I'm all about that. So I'm absolutely, looking, that's, that's part of the game, you know, it's flow. Part of the game. Yeah, flow is essential in the game, you know, and it's like until pe most people realize that, till they wake up to that, that this game requires flow for lots and lots of well, I think part of the problem, and we noticed this when we were doing the Cliff High series, is that most people are accustomed to an interviewer, interviewee type of show. And there's a structure to that and it's hierarchical and it's authoritative and you have the person who's the expert and the person who's doing the interviewing and people were comfortable with that type of slot because that's what mainstream media fed to them all of their lives. So we dismantle the structure a little bit and open up the free flow. For some people, this is a very challenging concept. So uh, to the listeners out there, allow yourself to be challenged by constructs and lack of structure in the flow of information because inside of all of that is a dynamic where you begin to flow as well. The audience, although you're not here on camera with a microphone, are part of the fluid dynamic of this as well by virtue of your consciousness interacting with ours. And also at some point in the series, just like we're playing with Cliff, there may be uh, an episode that is question and answer from you guys. So, um, you know, we we look forward to your participation in all of this. And when we decided we were gonna do a series together and we were tossing around topics, Sonia sent me sort of the topic of uh, the human game and default programs. So Sonia, why don't you tell us uh, where we're gonna start with this and then we'll just go wherever we go. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't even remember that's what she said. She's like, oh, she's like yeah, we're not sure where we're going with it. But here you go, we'll, let you, we'll throw you out there. <laughs> Hey, I love it. It's so funny. 
Yeah, I, it's like, oh, oh, now I'm standing on stage. I don't know what I'm talking about, people. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, so, okay, so we're talking about the human game and default program. And I, I guess when I mentioned that, how I, how I have seen all of this is the fact that um, we do operate by default programs. And what I mean by that is that there are default uh, conditions, default um, ways of operating, a default system um, that sort of regulates everything and everybody. And it continues to be that way until an individual has um, the certain levels of profound awakening. That default system is in place. You know, it counts, it, it keeps track of you, your you know, aging, your body, what happens with your body. If, for example, and I think I mentioned it the last time, for example, the idea of puberty and, um, you know, being shut on and being shut off because that's what puberty and getting older people tend to think you know that that's what happens to most people you get shut on right so that you can go into ma maturity so that you can reproduce on the planet and have those experiences um not just the individual experience but in terms of the contribution to keeping the game the human game going by repopulating it uh and then you get to this supposed age where particularly for women where they go into the shut off stage so, or people start getting old so there is this shut on and then there is the shut off so i guess my question a while back is was okay well what the hell is counting this you know what what is it that that's how does our body know to do that based on cycles based on how old you are and so then i started looking at that so based on one's age which it tends to be typically what around um uh, used to be around 12 13 those were more more the average age for uh, girls it may have changed a little bit because of all the preservatives in the food and stuff but it was typically right around that time that um girls would begin uh, to menstruate and and boys started going into um, their thing as well with the boys changing and so on. So uh, so so you look at that and you go, okay, so the body knows how to do this after so many rotations, after thirteen rotations. That's really what it is. After thirteen cycles or twelve cycles. So that was something that I started to uh, explore as to what was happening there. And then I, I started to realize that there has to be some sort of um, default system in place. Like you're hooked up to like a, a, like a network, like a central, um, a central system that has to do with obviously the rotation of the planet, the movement of everything, because that's how we're counting the years, the cycles, the days. Um, it's through that whole process and how it's networked uh, to the human body, the human brain, the the consciousness. This is like a whole series of you know networking systems that's making this whole thing happen. But it's default. Um, so to to just take that a step further, um, looking at that, do we look at the time that people start to get older or, or shut off there's also that aspect so what is it how does our body know how do we know when it's you know time to shut off so something is is creating that process and what is that based on is it based on the growth of the individual the ex the expansion and awareness or consciousness of the individual exactly what is happening here well, what I realized was happening is that when humans were living the basic birth to death, default, collective, programmed uh, birth to death lifestyle, um, they were then part of this thing that regulates our living, our people dying. It was something that was regulating that. Well, 
what happened is it possible to step off of that, step away from the default program? And that's what I realized, that it was possible to step away from the default program. But what that entails, now that's the question. That's the, a whole other level of, of that question. So I, I hope that just made sense, what I just said. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, totally. And I like, uh, at first I was thinking, oh God, she's going to piss off the flat earthers, right? But then you just said rotating. <laughs> so that could be around a circular disc or a ball. So it flat earthers be, hang yeah. out. <laughs> it could be, yeah, it could be any. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yes, we're, 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 we're I'm very joking. embraceive of the multicultural aspects of earthism. So whatever right? your particular spheres. We're, we're earth shape is. agnostic here. Yes. Yeah. Earth shape floats your I'm boat. bispheric myself. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Even even that, I am just I shouldn't say I'm amazed, but I find it so incredibly interesting when people are so bent on being so stuck to the fact that they're conscious and this is the way it is. Um, and they're really stuck on it. To me, that's a clear sign right there that you need to, you really need to take a deeper look at yourself because when you can bring finality to this experience, that is a red flag because this game is a trip. It'll let you, it'll let you believe what you want to believe. It'll, it'll give you or present you with the the experiences or the 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 reality or the environment that that will support your your belief and you can just stay within the confines of that comfortable space so if anybody is getting upset because they think you know oh no i believe the earth is flat um and somebody says the earth is round you you might want to rethink because i you know we said we don't we don't care we don't care because everything is everything. Any possibility we can think of is there. That's why it's called possibility. That's why it's yeah. like potential. Well, what, I, what I find with these things is when you become like super committed to one stance, you start to find yourself, sure, there are problems, like some of the things that they point out about the globe model and whatever NASA stuff, they have fair arguments and fair points. But when you start to become so sure that it's flat, you start to run into some of the same problems because just like we can't go up and look and see for ourselves if the earth is round, we also can't go up and look and see if it's flat, right? And, and so I don't, the, the, just the entire, I think you do yourself a major disservice in the game or the simulation or whatever this it's is we're limiting. in. Right, right. It, it, right. It, if you yeah. think of every, if everything has to be either or, why can't it be both and, right? Like, right. You know, especially it's if- It's a comfort it, thing. I think it's, it's what it is. Yeah. Human beings really, um, we, we, we need to feel like we have more control is what it is. And we need, and the way we feel that um, or we have that sense is when we have a some sort of conclusive concept uh, about something, then we can sink our teeth into it, then we don't feel like we're wandering in the dark. And that's what it is. It's, it's the unknown that people are challenged by. They, they don't want to deal with what appears to be the unknown. It's like they have to have something, con which is why religion works so well. They get something that is concrete. They can sink their teeth into it, and uh, and that's that's what people want. But the game is the game is just that's all I can say. The game is the game is a riot because it'll give you anything that you want. It is this. It is an incredible genie's lamp. So anything you get attached to, oh yeah, you will be convinced that that is the final. Uh, it is a con that's a conclusive um, understanding and everything you will run into everything that will confirm that it is conclusive. Yeah. That, it, yeah. you know, that's the way it is. And so that's why we're talking about flow in the very beginning um, before we got on here. And that this is why flow becomes so really important because you don't get attached to any one particular um uh, what, what should we say, a uh, concept. Not that you can't have a stance. That's not what we're saying. 
But where we are in every moment with what we understand, that's where we are. But we have to be open to allowing that truth and, and that understanding to continue to expand, to show us more. It's just greater levels of it. So we're not saying anybody is wrong. I'm not saying anybody is right or wrong with what they believe. But what I'm saying is that truth is always going to have a next level and a next level and a next mm -hmm. level. And if you're so attached to that concept, you limit being able to see more of what that truth can show you, the expansiveness of that, uh, the, the multidimensionality of, of, you know, of, of existence. And, and so that's what I say to that. So I'm not saying anybody's right or wrong. I'm just saying, hey, there's, there's a whole lot more. It's an endless expression. Reality is endlessly expressing itself in an endless amount of ways. No yep. finality and the, way, uh, and the many ways in which it can show itself. And that's what we're talking about with flow. Well, I think also like people... What, I, what I've noticed, you know, over my sort of process in my journey is that things that the, the, the higher my awareness level gets, the more possibilities there are instead of the less possibilities. A lot of people, I feel like they get into research or they get into truth and they like, they think they've found the truth about something and they actually then begin to regress in their progress on awareness or whatever, because so much of this is about awareness and perspective, right? And so when your awareness increases, you're now looking at something from a different angle or from a different space. And so yeah. something that maybe once appeared flat to you because you only had a certain level of awareness could suddenly be an energy ball with, you know, or something, you know, a toroid or something else or whatever. Right. You can see it from another angle. It looks completely different. I mean, I've often pro like proposed that what if we're dealing with the situation and this goes for not just for the shape of the earth, but for almost everything we look at, where there's like a disc of energy in the middle and then there's a toroidal shape around it and there's a conical thing that brings the energy out and lets it out the other side. And you know, there's different levels of geometry all the way around it. And as your understanding of, of those sort of shapes and forces uh, increases and your awareness of them does, you can see an endless amount of patterns around something, right? That makes it more and more complex instead of simplifies it. Well, and absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you're you're up. You're up, I absolutely agree with you on that. And and even if we look at um, again David Bohm and the and the as as an aspect team with their discovery of um, the atom when they were when they were looking um, I think it was it was it atom or, or part particles they were looking at um, these two particles and think and wondering you know are they how are they communicating no matter what the distances they're communicating. But it wasn't that they were communicating. It turns out that they were, they were one in the same. Well, that, mm -hmm. even just that realization is letting you know that all we're looking at, which is what you just said, is just different angles of a possibility. Like every single thing has multiple layers of um, of, of existence, of whatever form it may take. But I think because of our consciousness that is so affixed to a certain perspective of reality, because we all have this collective perception of what reality should look like um, here on the planet and, you know, outside of the planet, we have, we are, our brain has this, this fixed model of reality. And so people, some people become unhinged when things don't seem to be fitting into that particular model, not realizing that that model has, is, has multiple levels to it, but you're just affixed to one particular uh, visual of, of it, or you're seeing one particular frequency pattern, I should say, one particular pattern yeah. of, um, of, of that whatever that idea is. And you have wave and particle, that's another thing to look at. Well, the uh, wave and particle, they're one in the same. Um, as, as it said, they're one in the same, but everything is appearing and disappearing. Everything is, mm -hmm. nothing is static. So all of this 
idea of motion and and mm -hmm. movement and nothing being fixed to me tells you and even without the science even without the scientists telling me i mean it's stuff i already knew they just support it you know they but you if you allow yourself to just feel it's like creation always shows itself to you you might not we don't have words for it there's a point where there's no words that can describe any of this we do our best to describe within a certain uh context and within a certain uh limitation but after a while there's things that we cannot there's no words you cannot yeah you can, you language can, is an very inadequate language exactly. is very inadequate yeah. there's nothing that but but we're doing the best we can within just within the framework of um of the re of this reality this version of reality anyway and these concepts just enough to um assist ourselves and others as a, as a launching pad to launch into greater aspects of what's of potentialities greater aspects and when i say greater greater when i say it i don't mean better i mean simply more just more because we tend to be polarized like that's good or bad black or white you know it's better it's, you know, i'm not talking about that I think what you're talking about goes back again to what you brought up earlier, the flow, the fluidity, mm -hmm. the expansiveness. And see, part of the problem is that we're trained didactically. We're given all these rules and laws and theorems. We are presented with authority figures. They, they tell you about the law of gravity. And I go, well, but things violate the law of gravity all the time. So if I violate the law of gravity, is there a fine for this? I mean. Am I going to have to write a money check? Am I going to have to write a money because I violated the law of gravity or the law of thermodynamics? I mean, there's a second law, and you're just going, wait a minute. If I violate the second law of, and if I violate entropy, uh, do I have to pay it forward in the universe, or how does this work exactly? Yeah, I mean, where 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 are the anarchists against the laws of gravity and exactly. thermodynamics? Why, is, why are they only against the government's laws? <laughs> but, 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 you know, this yeah, is there really, are no laws. This is just <laughs> that's, that's how we've been thing. trained. It's rigidity. When you become flexible, you don't break as easily, and. One of the things that's a pleasure to me in my life is that I'm fluid enough to change my opinion of things, to expand concepts. And what you said earlier, really important, that point where there are no words anymore, where the French phrase for that is je ne sais quoi, where there are no words. I am going to simply behold and allow the beauty of the moment to express itself. Absolutely. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up um, as well, because... I think, you know, that's something I'm always talking about. Um, and I remember having this conversation with um, physicist um, uh, David Anderson uh, some years back. Oh, and we, we, yeah. we're, 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 well, we're well aware of him and this is- in, Dr. There's David already, Anderson. <laughs> there are already so many things that you, that you brought up just in the first 15 minutes here that nicely intersect on some of the things we've been talking oh, about with God. about time. So this right. is beautiful. Let's hear what David yeah. Anderson had to say. Well, no, but but I had said to him, I said, is it possible that there are, I mean, I already know it's possible, but I just stated that to him, that there there are no laws. The, the, the laws that we supposedly see are what we create for our own uh, comfort of understanding things within a certain framework. Of course, he did have to agree with me. He, he, I, he did. Wow. He, he, yeah. he agreed. He, I mean, he agreed because of how it was stated. But by the time I stated it, it's like when you look at it, it's like, well, yeah, you're right. There really are no laws. But the laws, these ideas, like like you were saying, um, you were both saying about these 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 laws, the laws of, of physics and the laws of this and the laws of that, is simply there, embedded in our minds so mm -hmm. that we will continue to hold in place a version of reality that is strictly designed based on those laws that are, uh, belong to that pattern, that, that yeah. pattern that forms that version. And, and it's, so for, it's almost like it becomes necessary for everybody to, yes, agree on these 
laws, but they really don't exist. There is no such thing. There is no law of gravity or anything. And this is this is the challenge for, for people because in order to move to these more expansive states, we're up against these embedded programs that are become genetic. They're part of the human gene pool. They become part of our bodies. They're part of the default system that I'm that I've been talking about. Um, this whole shutting off and turning on people getting old and people dying. People don't understand. This is all just part of a concept um, that's based on these these agreed on laws that everybody's operating by, but we're in a space, it's, it's we're in a time where that's sort of coming a little bit more unraveled, where pe more people are starting to talk about and to question. And so you can see this happening uh, a bit more. Is And mm -hmm. so there's a struggle to keep that, you know, you gotta keep that in place because that's the game, that's that version. And I think it's important yeah. to realize that what we're dealing with are versions of reality. Versions of reality, no different than we buy a version, a soft, uh, a software, different, different uh, versions, you know, whatever, point, point one point one or one, whatever, version two or whatever the case may be. It's the same thing that we're dealing with. We can only come up with these things based on the construct of this idea. So we're affixed to this virtual um, experience, this this freaking holodeck, <laughs> you know, that we've yeah. been dealing with. And we're breaking, you know, some of us are hacking it, basically. We're hacking our minds. Um, and and with hacking our minds, you know, we're hacking the game, this version of the game itself. Not good or bad people. I always have to keep saying that. I am not about let's escape this because escape to me means i'm running that there's fear mm -hmm. so it's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about transcending in a way where oh it's like oh okay i get it okay all right moving to the next level of possibility that that's what i'm saying absolutely um a couple of things come up there so guys what Sonia is talking about, she's a real anarchist. She's an alchemical anarchist. Like, you know, as much as I love the work of people like Derek Rose and, and Larkin Rose and people like that, they're very, very focused on one kind of law, like on governmental law, right? And that is, you know, there's all this other stuff that she's talking about that if you can really dis separate your mind from those things, then the kind of governmental law and the issues that they're talking about almost become completely inconsequential. Yeah. And so I love, that you, I love, I mean, literally, I think that, like what you just said was the first true representation of holistic alchemical anarchy that I've heard. There's people talking about all these different varieties, but what you just said kind of put all of what everyone else is saying on those topics to kind of shame. And I, I really appreciate that because those are things yeah, that are- so there's a state of mind, there's a state of mind that comes in and it's an organic process. And I, I've, I've been doing this for a lot of years now where after a while, I don't need to rebel against the government or the system or the financial system. I find, we find, we find ways to create new avenues of expression and creation to where those systems simply become peripheral to to our reality it's yeah, not like i'm pushing that. against it anymore i'm not protesting the banks or protesting the, the the office of the president or the political system i just look at it and i go it's really not a part of my reality i understand that it exists and functions the way it does but it doesn't impact me on an emotional level nor does it inhibit my free expression of my innate anarchism so in a sense we begin to reassemble like a Lego reality kind of thing and scramble the blocks and pretty soon it's unrecognizable and we just go on with it. We're just basically floating by that system and watching it contract and expand in, in however it, it, it deals with things. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes, you, you definitely said it. Um, that is very, very true. And that system is relevant to that version of the game. 
That's simply uh -huh. it. It is relevant. Everything is relevant according to the version of the game. And you have a choice as to um, your engagement with it. Now, there are people that, because we, you know, I've taken that journey. We've all taken that journey, uh, the sovereignty movement, you know, in the 90s. But it, it all led me here because I think that I needed to take a holistic look at the game itself and to see those components in the game and understand how, why we as human beings feel like there's a boot on our neck all the time um, and, and trying to seem like you're trying to get up all the time from it. And so you end up fighting with it and rebelling. But yet the this, this structure of this, this version of reality is based on war. It's based on conflict. It's based on, um, you know, competition. It's based on all of that. So the more you do that is the more you're actually doing the thing you're trying to get away from, which is to play that version of the game. Yeah. It's, it, it is. It's criminal. It's just <laughs> you end up just doing that very same thing. And so you find that people are getting into problems. Um, like even, okay, we'll just say real quickly, like the sovereignty movement. Yes. I get it. I totally get it. But, you know, people, you know, getting arrested, going through things, and then the fight, the fight goes on, the fight goes on. Um, but, you know, then, then you have to ask yourself at some point, it's like, okay, to what end and what am I really getting out of this? Because quite honestly, what I, when I, what I came to realize is that you just freaking just get put on another list. Now you get put on a list of people who are you know opposing the system it doesn't matter if you get your papers and all of that now you're just on another list so it's like you never really escape that game this game to to transcend this game is more on an energetic level and um and an awareness but it's something one has to do if one feels like you one has to do it if you feel like you need to fight for peace i tell everybody if you feel like you need to do that then i think you yeah. should do that you do everything that you feel you need to do in that moment because I don't know what it's leading you to. When I was dealing with a lot of that, somehow it led me here. At some point I woke up and I go, oh, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. I got all the information I need out of it. Now I'm moving to another phase. So you have to know what is working for you and tune into yourself and feel and know when you're done and be, you know, yeah. be okay with it. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And just to roll back to what you said about uh, this not being about escaping the matrix or escaping something because that's like running from something. I was just on the way home from work today talking to our friend Jeff Gates, who we have a lot of these kinds of conversations with. And we were talking about how sort of the point is not this escape thing because, you know, people, I, I, just like you were saying, like people who want to escape, you're running away from something that sort of leaves you very vulnerable to be sort of taken with something else or get, you know, get stuck in the, next, in the next level of something. The idea is to expand the awareness, be aware of the multiple realities, and to be like when you're becoming masterful of this game is the ability to move seamlessly back and forth between them sort of at your will. Right, and there is an, right, and you're, and you're not stuck in fear because that's yeah. what happens when you're talking escape escape is always like you're you're running and you know there's fear of of some of being caught or somebody coming after you or all of that it is just way much it is so much that is involved in that and then that fear just simply um it 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 gets incorporated into other components in your life because everything in your life is really operating off the same concepts the same formula you know, even though it might seem like things look different, but you're operating from a base concept of reality. Everybody is running their world. I always say you run your life, it's like running a business. Um, you know, you're operating from a some core ideas, some core beliefs about reality. And it's like, people need to understand that. So I always say, you know, you have to ask yourself, what, look at your reality and it's like, what, what do I know and what do I believe? And you look at all the things you keep talking about, that's your struggle and your, you know, patterns and this happening to me and why does, you know, this person, I get treated this way. We have to stop and we have to just begin to go, whoa, wait a second. What is the 
freaking blueprint that my brain has got? What is the model that it is holding about what I think reality is? Because your brain, you know, it just waits for permission. That's all it does. It waits for permission to show you more. It already has access and can, you know, see 360 degrees of everything. But there filters. It filters. That's so important for people to, to really remember that. Your brain filters according to your perception, according to what you can accept as a possibility. Whatever your perception is, whatever the boundaries are of your perception, that is your, your, your brain's um, cue to operate within the confines of that, that belief system, that perceptual yeah. um, structure. And, and your brain looks for patterns. So that's important too. Your brain looks for patterns. It always looks for similar. And then you get mm -hmm. fed the same thing, you know, over and over. So the, the point, the point not being to escape the boundaries, but just expand their, how far out they are constantly, like keep pushing, push the boundaries. Right, yep. right. Yep. yep. And the, you know, so I would say, ex, ex, um, open up the, um, or, or expand the latitude, stretch. Yeah. Just have, yeah. have none of that. Be where you are when you're there. And sometimes with myself, um, you know, I, and over the years, that's what I do. I might be in a particular um, way of understanding and operating and flowing and knowing, but I get this radar in me that says, you know what? I'm ready to step it up more, some more. And I do say that to myself. I say, you know what? I'm ready to step things up a notch. Now, I have learned over the years when I used to say that, oh, yeah, I don't know what's going to go falling apart in my reality. You know, <laughs> things start shifting around. Now, it doesn't happen quite like that anymore. My understanding has changed. And, and the foundation upon which my life was built has changed so therefore i don't have the the rug just being yanked out from under me not like that anymore and even if things change i no longer like react in, in a terrified manner that my comfort zone has changed and the uh the the certainties have uh have changed that's what people run from is the again the unknown it's being able to flow and know that with this change, looks like change is coming. I'm always going to be okay. If we can just know that, I'm, I'm going to be okay. Then you don't panic and then you end up making desperate choices, decisions. That's typically what happens because you, you, what do you do? You reach back into your memory bank of old solutions and ways of operating. And then at some point it backfires. It doesn't work because you're wanting to move forward, but at the same time, you're going back to this, to, to, to this um, learned um, uh, solutions, these old solutions, and then they become temporary. So it's all of that in, in looking at how we expand, how we grow, um, you know, how we transform. Uh, in our lives and and really begin to change all of just all of the the experience yeah one thing i i've noticed about you just i've gotten to spend a little bit of time with you but also just observing you over the years as i've followed your work is you tend to laugh at things which i at, at this i didn't always do that at this point in my life i do a lot of that also of like when something just absolutely crazy here and sometimes even when something yeah. like that is the funniest thing happened i laugh <laughs> And, and I laugh and I'm not necessarily like people, there's this interesting thing that happens though. Like uh, other people around me were sometimes more tolerant of it when I reacted mm -hmm. in a bad way. Right. Right. When right. The point where like when something shitty happens and I laugh now, it's almost like people look at me like I'm being inappropriate. <laughs> like like it, laughing. Like, what? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I and think so, it's funny because and it neutralizes, it, it neutralizes, it neutralizes it, things. And that's the energy. See. Yeah, absolutely. So then this, well. no, that, that's what cut me off anytime you want. I certainly cut everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, right? Yeah, but um, it is funny. It's all funny to me. I, I know I laugh all the time. But absolutely, yeah, laughter 
it just it neutralizes things and the seriousness is what crystallizes it because mm -hmm. what does quantum physics tell you it's the observer you know and 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 so just you being so serious about the situation is a um uh, what's the word it's instructions basically mm -hmm. it's saying crystallize this yep you know make it solid and so yep. you got to focus in on it but the laughter is what neutralizes it and you're since you're the power plant and everything has to be plugged into you that laughter you it's not able to plug in and so it realizes whatever it is there is no energetic engagement in that that would solidify it the that, that engagement that plug-in isn't there and so it goes away otherwise it's in your face going oh you want me to do what you you want okay you want me to make things uh more difficult okay uh all right i'm in your face because you're talking to me and you're complaining to everybody about how hard life is and so I, I i gotta you know the brain and your mind has to say okay well we gotta we gotta make that that possible we gotta bring in everything to support this it's like a script yeah. it is a script we have to it bring in all the characters and conditions that's yeah. going to support the story that you are so attached to and we've all done yeah. it yeah, I was what I was just going to say, and, and you just kind of went there without me even having to say it was that, you know, once we pass the point where we give in to fear every time and we're to the mm -hmm. point where we're laughing, well, then people will try to shame us into acting, having that same old fear reaction, right? And yep. if you give in to that, then you're, you're sort of you're playing a role. You're acting in a way that you think people want you to act because it's appropriate. And then you are actually now playing the part in the script. It's not even at all organic anymore. You're yeah. now sort of agreeing to that role. And so I say laugh. I say don't even worry about if it's inappropriate because if nothing else, laughter is a great disruptor. So if there's mm -hmm. some kind of bullshit trying to be run or program trying to be run and everybody else in the room is agreeing upon it and you're the great disruptor you know yeah, what i mean yeah. you may even wiggle room wiggle loose some room for other people to recognize that well wait a second we were just going along with this sort of you know program fear response just because it's considered the appropriate to appropriate response or, Absolutely. or you know, we know what to do when that happens we don't know what to do right. when somebody is laughing at, at something that maybe isn't appropriate but you're laughing because it's funny. You know what I mean? Like even when sometimes when shitty stuff happens, like it's, you know, especially when you gain the perspective of, okay, like every time something like this happens rather than, oh my God, this, all this horrible stuff is happening to me. It's all right, okay, this is a chance for me to yeah. monitor my response and level up. It's funny that the world would test me with this. Let's see where I'm at. You know what I mean? Well, so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I have laughed to add, very <laughs> 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 laughing again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have laughed at some things where, yes, it would be considered super inappropriate. And then you have to go, well, you know, if, anyway, you, if you go, well, why is it inappropriate? If you start questioning everything, because everything is a program, don't, yep. you know, like if somebody falls, okay, all right, so maybe I'm going to make sure they're okay first, but I'm for sure going to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, like, you know, I, whole, I mean, because it's funny. It's you know, fucking really, funny. Yeah, yeah, a real person when they fall, it's really, it's really funny. <laughs> they trip. <laughs> my husband, he sat in the chair and he's rocking it back. And I, I go, okay, now you know, I'm gonna check that you're okay. But when you fall, rest assured, <laughs> it's gonna be laughing. It's gonna be funny. So I think that, you know, we have all of these protocols of what to do and what not to do. And of course, you probably heard me. I'm always talking about the good person program because that one drives me crazy. Everybody wants mm -hmm. to be a good person, but that being a good person is based on the program, this collective program, this collective um, sort of uh, instructions of what you need to do to be a good person and it becomes the most artificial thing because all these people are running around with the mask on not really able to be themselves because you have to cover up you have to meet the conditions of this collective idea of what a good person is
So mm -hmm. I'm always like, if you throw that out, you don't even have to worry about being a good person because you're not going to have to worry about not behaving a certain way or not doing things a certain way. There, you, you move into this whole other space where you don't even have to worry about how you treat people. That, that even changes. All these things happen where we have to worry about how we treat people and how we do things because everybody's trying to adhere to the protocols of being mm -hmm. good people. When we let go, you're not even interested in the things then that would have been considered you not being a good person. It just doesn't even happen. But the yes. restriction and all of this energy that's put into the mask that you wear that it really ends up making people sick and creates more challenges because people have to suppress the truth of who they are because it's completely unacceptable. So I'm always saying, yeah, throw it off. And yeah, if people ever come to a retreat, trust me that that just is so thrown off. Yes. And we laugh about things that would be very inappropriate. And that's why we laugh because it's considered inappropriate. <laughs> I can't think of a better reason to laugh, right? <laughs> because it's so, yeah, it is. It's a lot of it is just so, if you really look at it, it's like, God, it's so dumb. You know, you really are believing this right now. Or um, laughing, okay, all right. Now, don't laugh at other people. See, when I laugh at, say, a situation, somebody, I laugh more about the game and the character the person is playing and the, the, how invested they are in that identity. That becomes funny to me. So I'm not necessarily laughing at the person like, oh my God, I'm so much better. I'm laughing at how invested they are. And I always say to my, my kids and my husband, I go, you know what? If you ever catch me going down the street in shorts and socks and sandals, please <laughs> feel okay to put me away. <laughs> There's these, these, you know, older people, and I get it, they don't care anymore. So they've got these outfits on that is so funny to me. But why is it even funny? It's funny because in my mind, in my brain, I've got a perception of what is acceptable. So it's like, no matter what you do, you've got layers of conditioned reality. You know, these things are funny. Well, why is it funny? Because in the game, uh, this version of the game, maybe in the Western world, to dress like that is inappropriate or it's, it's funny. So it's even looking at all of that. It, it, it's just layers deep. We're layers deep in it. And you have to come to a place where you're just okay with some of this and you just go ahead and laugh. Uh, so according to my program with, you know, what what is fashionable, yeah, that stuff is funny. No, and I'm not ready to wear that at this time. <laughs> so <I'm sorry. laughs> so it is. It is a funny kind of program. It makes me wonder how attached it is to whatever is keeping track of time and the cycles, like you said, that like they put like uh, stores that sell Hawaiian shirts there and somehow when every gentleman retires and turns, you know, 60, they feel like the need to go put themselves in some of those shirts, right? Like, <laughs> and same with some women, like women who are in their 50s and like the Chico stores, right? Like how is it that like, like right when in that age suddenly you're into this like khaki and like whatever kind of thing but it's like they're just assuming the position or assuming the role or the character right. so yeah it's funny you're right because i say that i always go at what point does that happen where you look in the mirror and you go this looks good <laughs> <laughs> but you're right though it is it is all part of these protocols act your age look your age you should be not appropriate for a woman of that age. All the whole thing from beginning to end is just layers of programs, and it's maybe just having maybe maybe the 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 game or the containment system or the simulation puts the Chico's clothing store there <laughs> when, when, when the woman shows up 
and buys her, her first outfit there, she's conceded that now I'm of a disadvantaged age and I submit to that program that I'm going to, it's like um, the system, you verifying with the system that you're on track on the program that they've set out for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And yeah. plus, plus you're, you're prepped for it every step of the way. You know, yeah. Small children, they know, uh, like the commercials, uh, you know, grandpa and grandpa is always, or grandma is always this whatever feeble and got something <laughs> going on with them. And so, so, so the child already has this program of this is what happens when you're older, when you get to a certain age. So everybody is sort of prepped for it every step of the way. And of course, now that we have, you know, it's a digital age and we have more commercials everywhere and billboards and so on you do get more of um, these, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, the upload isn't, isn't the word I'm it's looking like, for. It's like, the, like cues, 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 cues. Yeah, like cues. exactly. Yeah. You know, the, the, the age thing, you know, life insurance, you know, again, if you're between 40 and 80, um, just suggestions, lots of suggestions. And I did a conference that Truth, uh, was a Truth Mind Reality Conference, and, last weekend, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it was so funny because I, I was telling everybody, which the, everybody cracked up. I said, you know, yeah, those commercials that remind you, don't forget to die, because <laughs> that's what they <laughs> do. It's like, don't forget to die. You know, they yeah. give you. Well, that's fundamentally what you're talking about with retirement. This concept, <laughs> you're going to work for 40 years. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to scrimp and you're going to save. You're going to build a nest egg and then you're going to move off to Florida and play yeah. shuffleboard <laughs> until age 72 when the coronary kicks in and, 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 and this is all programmed. And your bucket list. Don't forget that's, bucket that. List. Now you got to have the bucket list. Did you check yeah, that off yet? Oh shit. I can't die this week. Yeah. I still have stuff to do. I haven't uh, gone zip, you know, zip lining yet. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's <laughs> it's so insane though but people don't look at it like that they don't look at this reinforced program it's reinforced every step of the way every stage this is the new stage oh oh uh the stage to what uh have your career or to get married by a certain time uh to reproduce make your contribution to the planet by a certain time uh and then you move into this other phase and then you know they do say that about um, women and menopause because they've been, you know, the scientists have been trying to figure that out and understand it because they also believe, as I do, that, you know, women shouldn't be shutting off like that. Um, but so what they're saying, and I, I agree because I said that, it, that, that this was based on some sort of adaptation that happened. Mm -hmm. And what they said about that ad adaptation was that, this is what they thought anyway, that over at some point women mothers it's it's like they couldn't be having children when their children were having children it's like the they wouldn't be able to be there that whole chain of whatever assistance or working with or helping it wouldn't be able to be there like the the grandmother is now just the grandmother and she's there to maybe assist you know, the, the dog the, with the grandchildren or whatever, that that whole thing kind of like needed to yeah. happen. But, you know, I, I have a, a different version. That's a whole other longer um, version of some of this as to why it happened. And I think that, yeah, I think it was a, I think menopause is about survival. It is a survival program. Um, when I started looking at it and I did a workshop a few years back, um, called decoding the female uh program or something like that um and it was it was looking at that whole idea that whole thing as to what happened um why women would have elected to at some point begin to retreat or, or almost collectively agree to shut off at a certain time and when you look at what women have gone through over the years, I don't know, thousands of years, what, what has happened even in war with, uh, not just war, but even in those times where uh, the, the woman didn't produce 
sons, you know, uh, and he produced daughters, they kill him. There's, there's a lot of things in this, in the psyche and in the female morphogenic field. I do feel there is a field for the, the women, female. When I say female, is that frequency? Um, in that, uh, as far as uh, the human female is concerned. And I think that it, it's like this ripple gets sort of sent through, this information gets sent through. And I don't believe that every woman on the planet is necessarily experiencing this, but I think that there is definitely um, a, a, a good portion in terms of that program or societies that might be exempt that we don't know about. But so, so kind of like, kind of, kind of like Wi-Fi and people who have not chosen to sign on to the network necessarily. Anyone who's signed exactly. on to the network is getting access to the same uh, program or web of matrix or exactly. whatever kind of thing. And that's yeah. why the missionaries become were so important because mm -hmm. even the missionaries' job was always yeah. to make yeah. sure that everybody uh, everywhere got hooked up somehow to yeah. a, a similar uh, program to, you know, all hooked and in. It, it's yeah. so interesting that the bulk of the missionaries, or a good amount of the missionaries are Mormon, right? And Mormons and their connection to masonry and the way they build and set up, you know, elaborate systems and whatnot. You know what I mean? It's very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, it is. It, it is. And, and, and it all, it is all, you know, it's all based on maintaining a a particular model or version of reality that that's all this whole thing is based on is ensuring that there is enough um human beings that they the ones they can reach anyway that we're all to some degree operating in that frequency um uh, uh, that upholds that particular mm -hmm. version of yeah. the game and so you have to get people to go out and make sure yeah. that everybody is they, hooked up. They only, That's they the original only smart technology. That's the original. Yeah. I was going to say they only allow like a new upgrade when they have that new version already under control too. Like they'll send you the update for your phone or your operating exactly. system. When they have all the kinks work out and they know how to control that new domain, they'll expand mm -hmm. it a little bit. They'll do what seems like an expansion to the people who are using it. But it's actually a contraction because the new version allows that whatever's controlling it to have even tighter right. grasp and control and their cycle, whatever is keeping track has gotten a better algorithm to keep further track. And yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because again, this is something that I've talked about also over the years, we've talked about the default program um, that, that there is a default evolution. There is a mm -hmm. default expansion mm -hmm. that happens and everybody is you know a lot of the new age stuff is you know everybody has to get on board if you notice there's always that trying to get everybody into this one movement to get on board and be ready for this mass ascension and i'm always <laughs> going no that's just a default evolution what happens in this this system the way it's set up is when human beings individually um, have not cracked the code or managed to hack themselves or hack the system, um, then there is an, an automatic evolution that is there. It's because you, because this thing has to keep evolving, but it's an evolution within boundaries. It's an evolution. Mm -hmm within a certain framework and that's basically it so then everybody thinks that we're yeah, 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 we're moving we're moving up well yeah you're moving according to the default structure it's a default uh, expansion that is happening and that's why people are not encouraged to individually be able to um expand or to move forward the only people that we know of that we hear about is okay well yeah, Yeshua, you know, Jesus or Buddha, but, or a few of the others, but, but that was different. They, they could do that. You, not you, you, you don't do that. You stay within the confines of this default program. And that, that is something that when I realized it, I was like, whoa. Well, the, only, the only evolution allowed for the standard person is to become a good person or to become a better person, which circles well, back to- Well, we've already lost that. that. We've already 
<laughs> we're, we're already not making it on that. On that. Right, but, think, but think about that. Think about how many people like in that controlled kind of evolution that you're talking about, like that, that you know, watch Oprah and read the book club. And yeah. after they've read all of these self-help books, they've managed to get control of their weight and be a little nicer to their mother-in-law, right? right? That's right, been their right. evolution into a better person. Right, right. A good, good, a, a good person you do for others. Um, be selfless. That's part of the program is just to be selfless and um, do, you know, do more for others than for yourself. I mean, there's all these, you know, conditions that people are trying to be. And I love when people say, you know, I don't know why that happens. I'm a good person. And I'm always like, that scares That's me. Why somebody yeah. said they're a good person. I'm just already, I'm like, that makes me nervous. The fact that you're saying you're, I'm a good person. Okay, well then you don't have to say that then. So, but it's it's like everybody wanting to meet this, this collective um, model and idea and live up to it. Uh, no different than failure and success program. So there's all these models and, and, and measuring stick and, and people are, are stressed out trying to live up to it. And why is it that they get, you know, they unravel like that? Because the human being, the, the human being really wants to, and the system helps to keep this lid on and it's like a pressure cooker, you know, and the, the pressure of it. And so people will be finding more people are becoming unraveled and they're doing all kinds of off the wall stuff um, because of that, that lid, because there's, there's pressure there because people want to be themselves. And when people don't get to do that, we see what happens. We have dysfunctional situations where parents, how parents are treating uh, their children, the uh, sexual whatever madness that goes on mm -hmm. people just become unhinged because they cannot they're not able to be themselves or to even know who themselves is or to connect yeah. with authenticity and to be able to be so aligned and tuned into themselves that they know what to do next but you don't we're totally encouraged to stay away from going inward. That is everything around us um, really supports or ensures that you don't go within. Don't don't go within. Well, you kind of get this version of going within, but not but it's not really. So everything is external. Everything is external because it's so necessary to keep human beings outside of themselves so that they don't really the majority won't make contact with that part of themselves that make them go uh oh wait a second oh you got me you know you don't want to because yeah. the game yeah. requires more people to be part of the game if everybody woke up and this isn't about everybody waking up somebody that's listening because people are always thinking how can we get more people to wake up you know, they, they want to do that. And I'm always like, you know what? You've got to focus on your expansion. You think you're awake, but this awakening is just ongoing, ongoing. It's just endless expansion in, into oneself, journeying into oneself. The more you focus on your own expansion is the more the reality you're experiencing begins to change. You don't have to worry so much about fixing people. They're there to be fixed because you need that. Just like the people mm -hmm. who are, um, you know, praying for peace. Well, they couldn't get to do that if there wasn't disruption, you know? So yeah. everything, you can't be, um, you couldn't complain about being poor if we didn't have this idea of people that are rich and the rich couldn't be rich if they didn't have the poor. So, so there's all of this going on and we need mm -hmm. to, we need to just be able to look at that and then be able to pull back, pull our minds and ourselves back and look at our own game. Ah, then it changes even the idea of money and what that means for you. And it, it changes it into something completely uh, different. So anyway. We're gonna change to something completely different because we're gonna flip the page here. Uh, for those of you watching, 
on uh, public platforms like YouTube. Um, this is goodbye. You mean them too. It's them too. Yeah, That's them what Jason Harvey calls it. Them and, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for those of you on Patreon, we'll see you on the other side of this. But before we go, Sonia, tell people where they can find you and what's going on in your world and what you uh, want to leave the public side with. Okay, that's a that's a good way to put that. Where can they find me? Well, I'm still looking for me. So when you find me, please let me know. <laughs> okay, in the game, you can find my go to my website, therealsoniabarrett.com, therealsoniabarrett.com, and uh, you're gonna see a lot of what I'm doing. I've got a few conferences I'm speaking at, the Human Origins Conference, but that's in October and that's in Sedona. And then a transformational, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, that's in New Mexico. And transformational ship conference, that's in Sedona. And then I'm doing one called Atlanticron, that's Romania. Um, and then wow. New York in uh, June 2nd um, in, in New York. I'll be doing a, a four-hour a four workshop on Saturday, June 2nd in New York. And all of that information is going to be on my website, therealsoniabarrett.com. Awesome. Yay. We'll turn the page right. and uh, be back in a few. With a lot more laughs. <laughs> right. Welcome back now here. <laughs> <laughs>